Hello, I'm Dr. Grant Stevens. I'm clinical professor of surgery at the University of Southern California and the program director of the Marina Rocks USC Aesthetic Fellowship. You're listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. On this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, we welcome Dr. Grant Stevens, founder and medical director of Marina Plastic Surgery. He's also the chairman of the USC Marina Aesthetic Surgery Fellowship and the director of the USC Division of Aesthetic Surgery. Dr. Stevens is on the board of directors of the American Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgery and is chairman of the Media Relations Committee and Exhibits Committee. He's an active member of the International Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgery and is on the board of directors and one of the international traveling professors. He is past chairman of the California Medical Association Advisory Panel on Plastic Surgery. Dr. Stevens has authored more than six articles and chapters on aesthetic plastic surgery. He's also lectured at numerous international, national, and regional meetings. He's appeared in over 125 television programs, including CNN, 60 Minutes, MSNBC, CBS News, Extra, Entertainment Tonight, Inside Edition, and many other TV and radio interviews. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome plastic surgeon, Dr. Grant Stevens. Doc, how are we doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being with us. So let's get this thing started. You know, what were your goals and aspirations during your residency? Well, survival was probably my primary goal and aspiration. Actually, uh, Dr. Weeks said when I arrived that he was expected 120 hours a week out of me. And I knew that it was going to be kind of arduous and tough. But I assume you're talking about my plastic surgery residency, right? That's correct. So I did general surgery first. And I was fortunate enough to come back to Washington University Barnes Hospital for three years. And when I started, um, my, my goals and aspirations actually were just literally uh, to learn to be the very best plastic surgeon I could. I did not know at the beginning what I was going to do by the end or in, with my career. I just knew I loved plastics and I wanted to learn as much as I possibly could in those three years. So kind of taking us through that chief year and the somewhat of the fellowship program that you were in, you know, what was your mentality getting into your first job search and how that perspective changed in the beginning years of your career? So by the second year, I knew I wanted to pursue aesthetics. And this is back when we rode dinosaurs to work. So um, it didn't look like it does today. We, there were no aesthetic fellowships. Um, there were the, the aesthetic uh, society or the, the American society for aesthetic plastic surgery existed. And I certainly studied that and emulated those people. And I knew I wanted to come back to Southern California and become an aesthetic plastic surgeon. So with that in mind, I followed the people in my program that seemed to be doing more aesthetics. Now, it was very rare that most people did not do aesthetics. They did reconstructive plastic surgery. For instance, burns, hands, neuro, micro, craniofacial, and trauma, and so forth, cancer surgery. They, there were some people that dabbled. There's nobody that really specialized in aesthetic surgery in my department. Um, and I did not do a formal fellowship. On the other hand, I had an amazing opportunity uh, of, to operate on people in the clinic and had an unlimited amount of money to spend that was called the Triple X Fund through Washington University. And, and it, when I say unlimited, I mean literally unlimited. And so I uh, set up uh, phone recorders in my home that had little cassettes and they would take phone calls from people as though it were an office and they'd say, you know, you've reached the offices of Dr. Grant Stevens, please leave your name and number and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. And I would come back from, uh, from, from Barnes, from where I was uh, training, I would get these messages and call these people and then schedule them myself. And I had the opportunity to do unbelievable amount of aesthetic plastic surgery. I, I must confess, I also had business cards made. So now I know Dr. Weeks can't fire me. It's so many years from now from, since he accused me of this. And I did take my cards. I did go to strip clubs. I did go to East St. Louis. I did solicit people for surgery and triple X funds and, and so forth. And they called in. So I did over a hundred breast dogs by myself in my chief year. 
I did 54 rhinoplasties. These are all documented numbers. And I had the opportunity, thanks to the generosity of the program, to basically do a fellowship, uh, self-trained, if you will, fellowship. And that's really what gave me the lift and the, and the confidence to come out to Southern California on my own. And uh, I did not go into practice with anybody. I came in to Southern California, Maria Del Rey and Beverly Hills, both. Um, I had two offices and I started doing aesthetic plastic surgery, but I had hand boards. And for the plastic surgeons watching this, I did successfully complete a hand fellowship with Dr. Weeks because I did three years in those days, people were only doing two. And uh, so I did do hand surgery for the first three years, a lot of hand surgery for the first three years while I was getting my aesthetics practice up and running. So when you came out here to start your own practice, at that time, did you ever consider going the academic route or were you really focused on building your own empire? Well, I don't think they're mutually exclusive, but I'll, and I'll tell you that as soon as I got here, I went to UCLA and spoke with those folks and actually went on as a clinical professor or clinical assistant professor of surgery there at UCLA initially. Um, Dr. Weeks had offered me a position there at Washington University, and, and I published even as a resident. I was very interested in academics, and in particular teaching. And so when I got here, I immediately went to UCLA and, and started, and I was teaching at the, at the VA hospital and so forth with the residents there. Um, but plastics is a unique specialty in that a person can have a clinical practice and still be a academic person outside of a university. It's very unique in that we can do both. And I've proven it and others have before me and since me. You, it's really wonderful because you can teach, you can publish, you can do clinical research, you could even do bench research and still have a uh, private practice uh, opportunity and like I do. I mean, I've been in practice now for 33 years, and I've published extensively. I've taught extensively. You know, I've run the fellowship. The fellowship now is in our 20th year, and I'm so happy with the fellowship, and it's a blast to teach and learn from the fellows. I mean, I learn every day from the fellows, uh, and, and, that, and you can't do that in every field in medicine. In plastics, you can, and that's one of the wonderful things. It's probably one of the best things about my practice. What would you say were some of the keys to your success that shaped your early career as you climbed to the top of the plastic surgery industry? Wow. That's a tough question. You know, I think that probably if I look back, I didn't have any preconceived notions of what could or could not be done. I think one of the things I see in my fellows and residents is that some of them have this idea of what is what can or can't be done. I, I actually, I had no limits. I, I, I decided to do what felt right and ethical and, just, and pursue my dream. And my dream was to build a practice to provide quality care that was safe and effective. And also I fell in love with technologies, as you know, and, and I coined the concept of the technology of beauty, which is also my webcast, as you know, or podcast, excuse me. Um, and I didn't have any, I had no ceilings. I didn't feel like I had any limitations put on me. Uh, and I just pursued my passions with no limits. Yeah, I think that's a really strong point because a lot of times when I'm speaking to clients, whether they're chief residents or fellows, Limitations are a big thing, and obviously, it's only in their mind of how they're viewing it. So, I really respect that, that viewpoint on that. Now, seeing that you're running one of the top fellowship programs in all of plastic surgery, what advice do you have for the graduating chief residents and fellows entering the professional job market for the first time? Well, I would encourage them to pursue their dreams, to not put any limitations on their dreams. I would encourage them to pick the area where they want to live. That's one thing that comes up all the time. I'm a big believer in picking where you want to live and then going from there. I, 
I know some people don't buy that. They want to go where the job opportunities are better. And perhaps if they're going to just stay in academics, that's fine because they'll move around the country. But I'm a big believer in picking where you want to live based on the quality of your life. You know, do you want the ocean? Do you want, you know, what, what do you want? And then build it from there because you're going to be there for a while. You're going to be there 20, 30 years if you're like most surgeons. So pick where you want to live. And then from there, then look around at the opportunities you have and don't be afraid to take risk. Uh, I see a lot of people going the safe route and with a stable um, salary or benefits. And I would discourage that. I would say take risks and uh, take the lower salary with the higher possible percentage if you're looking at joining somebody or if you're looking at starting your own practice, go for it because you're going to get a lot more out of it that way. Uh, and it's probably because my overall philosophy, I, I'm not very risk adverse. I believe in putting it all on the line. And I can guarantee that if you've never failed, then you've really never succeeded. You've never really pushed your limits if you've never failed. And uh, this fear of failure is what handcuffs a lot of these residents and fellows, they just, they want the safe way out. And, and that's just a guarantee to mediocrity. Very well said on that. Now on that thought process, you know, what were some of the things that looking back now, when you first started your practice that maybe you learned the hard way or they would have given yourself different advice now? Cause as we know, a lot of plastic surgery candidates do end up going to the private practice market. Yeah. Wow. That's a, that's a compound and complex question, your honor. Um, so in terms of what I would advise them and what have I learned, I think that I think that I was a little too brash and I think I was a little too outspoken. And I think I would have had an easier time of it if I'd been a, a little more circumspect. Uh, and I know this flies in the face of my last answer in a sense, but I could have toned it down a little bit and it would have been a lot easier. I did have some, uh, some earlier issues and the old guard really was not comfortable with me. And uh, we had to go through a lot of uh, issues. You know, I prevailed. The fact is I did prevail uh, on all of them, but it was a little painful uh, and, and emotionally it was, it was tough, but I came through, obviously, and as you know, I ended up being the president of the Aesthetic Society and, and all the various things. But in those middle years, in those early years, it was tough. So I probably would be a little more uh, circumspect, a little less brash, probably. You asked me my advice. That's probably my advice, but I'm not suggesting I could probably do it. <laughs> I'm a rebel at heart. I respect that. Now, seeing that we're in a pandemic year uh, with what's going on in 2020, what advice do you have for the graduating class regarding their networking and outreaching process when they don't have the ability to meet folks like yourself at national conferences? Well, I would say uh, to get on as many Zoom calls as possible, to contact the Aesthetic Society, the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery, contact Sue Dykema. We have an open door to young people we have expanded our, our opportunities and we're using digital uh, Zoom and other FaceTime and so forth uh, vehicles with which to communicate and educate, throwing yourself into it, immersing yourself. There's never been a better time to be a young plastic surgeon. I can tell you right now, we've torn the walls down, we've torn the barriers down we, in terms of everything, in terms of, uh, sex, in terms of ethnics, in terms of age. When I started, it was a pain. It was absolutely terrible. They were a bunch of old, white, gray-haired guys that didn't want any diversity at all. It was absolutely terrible. And it took years and years and years to tear those walls down. And I fought it. And I can just say to you now that if you're a young person and you're interested in aesthetics, when you want to get involved, the barriers have been torn down and you can do it. You can do it right now. You can pick up the phone, call uh, the Aesthetic Society and get involved. And you can call my fellows 
My fellows will tell you how to do it. We need your brains and your horsepower and your uh, uh, hard work, your intelligence and so forth. And with that, we will all grow. Our patients will do better. You'll do better. You'll meet a ton of people. It doesn't matter if we're not having meetings. I, I, of course, I really miss meetings. I'm a social animal. But even without the meetings, what we're doing digitally has been fantastic. And also look into the company called Engage, Engage Media with the QR codes and the drip uh, media, drip marketing. I would encourage them to look into Engage. It's, it's a big deal. It's the future of, uh, of actual communication. And uh, certainly within aesthetics and outside of aesthetics. Now, you know, I work with surgeons all across the country. And the thing that gets talked about a lot are, you know, for your instance, for you, for, you know, the, the P5s into their chief years, what does a fellowship director look for when they're going through the interview process in selecting their fellowship candidates? It's a great question. Um, I find that almost all of the applicants are smart. So I'm not really looking for the cognitive horsepower. Uh, I mean, I obviously I do ask them some basic things. I look at their academics. I look at their training. But for the most part, by the time they get to see me, they've been vetted and they're all very bright. So that's not the criteria I'm looking for. I expect that and they all pretty much uh, achieve that. What I'm looking for is hard work, start, self-starters, uh, initiative, creativity, people that ask questions, that are prepared to function outside of the box. I'm not looking for somebody just to come in and be a yes woman or yes man. Uh, I want people that are creative. And, and I said hardworking and show initiative. Seeing that you've been a president of multiple different societies, what are some memorable moments that you've held as far as being a leader? And how have we helped the younger generation succeed in going to their professions? What was the first half of that question? Uh, what have I seen and what do I remember? Uh, my, my mentors who taught me and encouraged me are the people that I remember and I think about. I really believe I am no better than the giants upon whose shoulders I stand. And I am only standing on those giants' shoulders. A few of them are still alive, and I thank them. And uh, I look up to them. I, and uh, I watch what they do. They inspire me. They've taught me through my educational process and also in the, in the political process. So when I think of people like Fahd and Hai, and Sherelle Aston, and Steve Bird, and Paul Weeks, and uh, and I don't want to offend people. We've lost some this last couple of years. We've lost some incredible mentors of mine. I think of Gene Curtis, who gave me such guidance when I was a resident. And when I think of the meetings, I can remember the meetings, and I can remember them what they said to me to keep me going and keep me on my A game and raised the bar so high. And they did, and they, they, they raised the bar, and um, I had to work hard to, uh, to achieve that, those goals. But you know, without them, I wouldn't be who I am. And I know that, so they are the giants. And that's what I remember. What are we doing? I'll tell you what we're doing. We're putting young people on the board. We're putting young people in all the committees we're putting women on the board. We're putting women in positions of power and leadership. I'm happy to tell you that during my presidency and prior to my presidency, when I took this initiative, we have increased the young people. We have lowered the average age. We were a dying society with the average age going up every single year. And I turned that around and we turned that around. We have opened the doors, we beat the doors down it, especially if they do aesthetic fellowships that are endorsed by this exercise, it, then it's a total piece of cake. Once you become boarded, you're in. But even if you don't, you still can get in with a lot less BS and, and, and a much clearer path and get yourself involved in the committees. Take ownership, take leadership. 
the 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 ceiling, the glass ceiling's gone. If you call me, if you call any of the leaders, you will, if you say, I want to get involved, whatever it is you want to get involved. We have many, many committees. And there's something for everybody. And I would encourage you to get involved. And the more you get involved, the more people you're going to meet. It's a small group of people. This is a very small network of people. We're only talking a couple thousand people. And of the couple thousand, probably only a couple hundred really are the people that are making the decisions. So if you want to be a leader and if you want to be involved, you can get involved. You just have to roll up your sleeves and get to work and throw yourself into it. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.